Good afternoon. My name is Phil Clotius. I'm dean of the law school here in Wilmington University. Uh, thank you all for coming, uh, both in person and online. We always appreciate the support we get from our Wilmington community and family. Uh, let me start by just outlining kind of the format for what we're doing today. Uh, you can see there's eight other people up here with me, and they are our new faculty for the law school. Uh, the plan is to let all of them talk uh, three to four minutes. Uh, no faculty member in the country has ever limited themselves to three to four minutes, so when they go over, we'll probably be a little uh, later than that, and then we will throw it open uh, to questions from media and in-person and uh, chats and all that kind of stuff. So that's our general format, and uh, without any further ado, uh, we'll start. Um, buildings, curriculum, uh, uh, cool bar passage ideas, all the stuff that you've heard from us means nothing if we have the wrong people, right? President Harmon tells me all the time that this stands and falls on who we are and the people we hire. Uh, we can't be more impressed with all the people we've met from Wilmington, and it's my honor to introduce these eight people as our first faculty, and I think you're gonna find that they fit in completely with our culture and our mission. You've got uh, their backgrounds either on the internet or in your hand and paper. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, the bigger thing is try to get a sense of who they are as people because that's more impressive than the impressive resumes you're seeing. So without more, I'm gonna, we're gonna be passing the mic down. I'm gonna introduce first uh, Professor Larry Ponaroff down to my far right. Uh, again, uh, we could spend uh, two hours on Larry's resume. I'll just tell you, and they like that. Uh, I will tell you he's been dean at three different law schools. He has, uh, I don't know, I've lost track, seven books, 35 publications. He's been teacher of the year in four different schools, and uh, he teaches contracts. He will teach contracts for us. He's also our special consultant to tell us when we're doing something really crazy or we're doing something the ABA is going to say, you can't do that. So he also helps for us for that. So Larry, you're up. Thank you, Phil. I, I'd like to um, share with you uh, just some thoughts about why this opportunity, and I do consider it very much of an opportunity I'm flattered by, uh, was attractive to me. Um, you would not guess this by looking at me, but I'm in the autumn, perhaps even early winter, um, of my career. And over the course of basically four decades, nearly, in legal education, I've observed a trend. Uh, I'm overgeneralizing to some extent, but there's definitely been a trend, and it's disturbing. Uh, and that trend has been a de-emphasis on the core educational mission of the institution. Now, I get faculty, law faculty, have professional and public service obligations. Certainly, their scholarship is very important. I've done my share of both, but ultimately what we're there for is the students, is the classroom and all the co-curricular activities that accompany it. And as law, legal education has moved away from that focus, um, it's been disillusioning to me. Um, and when I read the mission of this new law school, uh, where the focus uh, is entirely on the student experience, you have a proposal of something you want to do and you bring it to the dean, invariably his first question will be, how does this impact or help students? Right. That, to me, was extraordinarily um, refreshing. Uh, it, it was mentioned, I, I've been a dean of three different law schools. I've hired a lot of faculty members. And what I've noticed, again, a trend of um, new faculty to say, well, you know, I, in my, my first year, I'd like a, a light load. OK. And then I'll need release time in my third year so I can do my scholarship to come up for promotion. And can it be guaranteed 
that every year I will have one of my courses um, will be a seminar. And I'm sometimes tempted, was tempted, I didn't ever did it, to say, you do realize this is a teaching job, don't you? Um, and uh, so coming full circle, being part of an institution that puts the students front and center um, is extremely uh, attractive to me. I, I, at bottom, I believe what we're in the business of doing is training bright, young, and sometimes just young at heart people to be leaders in their profession and their um, community. Um, the second uh, aspect of, of this opportunity that um, I have to admit this is a little selfish on my part, you don't often get an opportunity uh, to be part of building something um, from, from the ground up. And that's really energizing. And as a consequence of that, you put those two things together uh, with the um, extraordinary culture uh, of this university, the collegiality, um, it was uh, very easy for me to say, yeah, um, I not only want to be part, but I'm flattered and excited to be asked. Thanks, Larry. I have to tell you, you paid more attention to him than his students ever have in a class. I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate the audience reaction. Uh, next up is Patty Wise, Patricia Wise. Uh, she has an outstanding resume. Clearly, the high spot on it is she was my former student uh, and my research assistant uh, back at Toledo when we were both there. So uh, if you take a look at what she's done, Patty is uh, an equal employment specialist. Uh, she's also uh, a professional responsibility expert. Uh, we're pulling her out of Ohio. So if you look at her resume, she's been on the uh, Ohio Professional Responsibility Board for nine years, just came off that. Uh, she was also appointed a special assistant to the governor of Ohio. Um, I'm, I'm going to forget how many books everybody has up here, so I'm just going to pass that. But Patty is experienced in legal education as a visiting teacher at Toledo. She's also published. She's going to be teaching torts and professional responsibility for us and constitutional law. So again, Patty, what, what drew you here to Wilmington? Thank you. I am so excited about this opportunity and there are so many reasons why I'm uh, happy to be here. The strength and support of Wilmington University and Dr. Harmon, uh, it couldn't be a better fit. And as Larry said, every decision, uh, and again, in keeping with the mission of Wilmington University is how does it benefit the students, right? So of course, this is the place to be. Um, also the access, that we're going to be able to provide for traditional and non-traditional students. Uh, there are so many aspiring attorneys who want to serve their communities, who want to work in the area of social justice and the flexibility we're gonna have here, the affordability, uh, the focus, the student-centered focus is gonna allow so many people who really weren't sure, but they're gonna now know that law school is a possibility. Uh, diversity. In, in diversity in all aspects of that word. Again, an important part of the mission of Wilmington University. So um, we're gonna be able to successfully educate students. You know, we're focused on bar passage, but also on successful careers as attorneys. We're gonna be able to educate those students so that they reflect the communities they serve. So, um, you know, I guess my answer would be, why wouldn't you want to come to Wilmington to, to start this school of law? Um, how exciting is it? And I guess I probably should say, I also love to teach. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Patty. Uh, next up, another person whose highlight is that he had me for constitutional law uh, when he was a law student. Um, the first person I've ever met who on our second meeting said, I want your job. <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, I want to be a law professor. So Michael has always tried to be a law professor. Again, he's our kid. We had to have a couple of kids on the faculty, so he's one of our kids. Um, he's currently uh, serving a clerkship on the Third Circuit, uh, which is a prestigious appellate uh, position. He will also be teaching legal writing and property for us. Mike? Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, 
for that introduction and for you know bringing me onto your staff here. Um, like Dean Cloche just said, uh, we first met uh, approximately five years ago when I started as a student at the University of Baltimore. And uh, something I immediately admired was his commitment to the students. Um, it was evident then, it's evident now that this is about helping the next generation uh, of future lawyers you know, get their start and hit the ground running. Um, prior to my foray into legal academia, um, I had over a decade of experience as a, uh, a college wrestling coach and a, a private academic tutor. And I've always loved educating. Um, I posted on my own personal social media yesterday for the first time that I accepted this position. And I had over 20 of my former students and athletes reach out to me and say, oh my goodness, let's, let's talk. And that's something that I've loved. I've forged these you know, lifelong relationships with my past students. Um, I've seen them have success in all of their personal endeavors. And uh, that's something I'm looking forward to doing here, is uh, maintaining and building new relationships and seeing individuals have success throughout the, you know, all of their legal careers. Um, and then Wilmington specifically is an incredible opportunity because I feel like it's a startup. You know, my wife's in a startup and I see what that's like in the private sector. And um, you have more flexibility, you have more opportunities to shape what the future is going to look like. Uh, there, you know, there's no traditions to break or, or feel like you have to adhere to. Uh, when we're sitting in that room together as a group yesterday, uh, inventing those traditions or what might become those traditions, or have Larry tell us, no, that's not. <laughs> um, so it's, again, it's exhilarating. Um, also being from Baltimore, living you know, the first 30 plus years of my life there, um, I know this whole 95 corridor very well. I think it's going to provide a, a lot of incredible opportunities to our students. Um, seeing these facilities for the first time, I think they're probably the finest in that whole region. You know, again, we're the newest building, and what's great is this building as new as it is, as it is isn't even the, the new building, you know? <laughs> um, and just with the lessons that we've learned through the pandemic of how uh, technology can facilitate a higher quality learning experience uh, and seeing those being incorporated into what Wilmington is putting forward or putting together for our students um, is something, again, that drew me here and excites me. Um, and again, I don't want to run over my time. We have some impressive people here. Uh, strictly as a public service announcement, uh, you should know that Mike financed his undergraduate and his legal education playing poker. <laughs> so if afterwards you meet him and he says, would you like to join a poker game? Uh, I would advise you to say no to that. Um, next up, uh, uh, Alex Smalls. Uh, who I think is going to be a mentor to me. Uh, Alex has, most of you know, a uh, distinguished career as uh, 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 chief judge for the Court of Common Pleas. He was the first African American uh, to be uh, appointed as a presiding judge in the state of Delaware. Uh, we couldn't be happier to have his guidance and his insight on the faculty. Uh, he will be teaching, please guess what, civil procedure uh, since he's done. I don't even want to know how many cases he's presided over in his uh, almost 30 years on the bench. So, Alex? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be a part of Wilmington University. Wilmington University is a mainstay in Delaware. It educates probably more individuals than any other college in the state. The philosophy is, come to us and we'll take you where you want to go. And when I spoke to Phil about um, coming aboard, uh, we talked about the philosophy. The philosophy is give someone a legal education for which they can use at a cost which doesn't burden them for the rest of their life. And that's what the philosophy is here, and it builds on the philosophy of Wilmington University. For 29 years, I sat on the Court of Common Pleas bench and you see the lawyers that come before the court. And there's a, a lawyering skill. The good lawyers, the bad lawyers, the lawyers that's trying. But what we didn't find is a good demographic uh, um, mix in terms of the lawyers. And that is because, um, as everyone knows, Delaware Bar is, is a very difficult bar to pass. And one of the things that Phil talked about is that we're going to equip them to meet that burden. 
So if you're equipping someone to meet that burden, then you can become a lawyer. If you become a lawyer, you can help your community. You can move forward. With that vision, I think we are embarking on something that's going to be a turnaround for the bar, that's going to help the community, and I'm pleased to be a part of it. Thank you. We're going to move to my far left now and introduce uh, Professor Edwin, Edson Bostic. Uh, Edson uh, was for a long time a veteran uh, a public defender in the federal system. Uh, if you're not a lawyer, you don't know what that is. That means every criminal who appeared in federal court who was indigent uh, got Ed as their lawyer, which means he is probably the most trial experience in criminal law, certainly in the state, maybe in the country. So he has spent a lifetime uh, devoting himself to representing indigent criminal defendants. And again, in what passes, I guess, for insight, I said, boy, maybe he should teach criminal law. Uh, so he's going to come on board and teach criminal law for us and also do some, some trial advocacy things down the road. But uh, Ed, again, is just a, a fantastic story of who he is, and we, we couldn't be ple more pleased to have him on the court. Ed? Uh, thank you. And um, it's, it's good that I get to go after uh, so many other uh, impressive individuals here. And that's one of the reasons that I am part of this faculty, the opportunity to work with so um, uh, well ta talented and impressive uh, professors is unbelievable. Um, in terms of why uh, Wilmington University, um, the three important things um, for me are the inclusivity of the law school, uh, opportunity, and diversity. And um, I grew up from about five uh, being told that I should go to law school. And it was very ironic because I grew up on a small island until I was about uh, 13, Barbados in the West Indies. And, and we were not wealthy. We didn't have the means for me to go to law school. Um, and so I always thought it was ironic when my mother would say that to me. But once we came to the United States, that uh, those opportunities, opportunities opened up. And uh, it's important to me that the concept of the school is to give opportunities to people that would not necessarily be in, in um, uh, a law school class and to put them back into the community to try to serve the communities from which they came from. I, as, as Phil has said, have spent the last um, 25, 30 years doing federal criminal defense, representing indigent, indigents, and uh, giving back to the community in my own in my own way. Uh, I was just signaled to uh, bring this microphone a little closer, and I apologize for that. Um, but that is why I'm here, and I'm hopeful that with my experiences that we can get more people, funnel them more into the public sector uh, of, of um, law practice, but to welcome all of those that would not otherwise uh, apply to law school. So I thank you for making me part of uh, the faculty. Thanks, Ed. Uh, next up is uh, Veronica Finkelstein. And uh, when I first met her, after reading her resume, I said, Veronica, do you ever actually like sleep like the rest of us? Uh, she works for the US Attorney's Office. Uh, she tries cases. She's been appointed to teach the other US attorneys how to try cases. Uh, in her spare time, she teaches as an adjunct at Drexel. She teaches as an adjunct at Rutgers Camden. And she is uh, one of the leading teachers at something called NIDA, which is the National Institute for Trial Advocacy. Uh, I don't know how to really describe this, except telling you at Rutgers Camden, she has won every Teacher of the Year Award since 2007. Um, that's an amazing streak, right? Yeah. yeah. We got a lot of Teachers of the Year Awards up here. But Veronica, she's going to come and also be active in helping us to establish uh, a trial advocacy uh, program that we think is going to have national recognition at some point fairly, fairly soon, right? I absolutely love the law. I am not one of those memes. I don't complain about long hours. I have the best job you could possibly have, and I know it. And the reason that I love the law is because I had a great professor in law school who showed me 
how to really unlock the power of the law. And with apologies to the dean, I did not go to his law school, so it wasn't him. It wasn't him, but I had a wonderful criminal law professor who showed me how important the law was and how it could make a difference for people. And I love to teach and I want to be that teacher. I want to be that person who makes the difference for the students at our law school. Uh, there are different paths that people take to get to law school, and there are different paths that our students are going to take when they graduate, but I want to be part of setting each of those students on their path. And so I'm very excited to be here to have, going from one dream job truly to another dream job, getting to do what I love to do full time. I'm very appreciative and thrilled to join this law school. For those of you who are getting to know me, you know she really sealed the job. And at the end of her first interview, she casually mentioned, oh, by the way, I really like to bake. Is it OK if I bring baked goods to school if we come? So that was pretty well. Uh, th that, that and horses. Uh, baked good and horses. She lives on a farm and has horses. So that was pretty well that. Uh, next up, uh, Nicole Mosey. Um, as most of you know, at Wilmington, we have uh, an undergraduate degree in uh, uh, legal studies and in paralegals. And uh, I went to the directors over there and said, by the way, is there anybody teaching in your legal services uh, courses, undergraduate, that we should be aware of? And uh, uh, Nicole basically said to me, uh, we have one person and there isn't a number two. Uh, she is so clearly our best teacher that this is the person that you really need to consider seriously. Uh, we then set up interviews and everybody was completely wowed by her. Uh, she has dedicated a career so far to social justice and public service. She's been in a variety of uh, state of state of Delaware offices, uh, including a current stint in the Delaware uh, uh, Department of Justice. Again, we couldn't be happier to have Nicole with us and the energy she brings for uh, public service and social justice. Nicole. Thank you, Dean Clotius. Um First, I just have to thank President Harmon for all of your leadership with Women's University and for uh, pushing the, the effort and the charge to establish this law school. And then also thank my chair, Nicole Ballinger, um, at the undergraduate program for legal studies. I recently started teaching um, here at Women's University as an adjunct professor in a legal studies program just a few years ago, and I loved it. I, I just adore teaching. I'm very passionate about students, about getting, giving them not only the doctrinal understanding of the curriculum, but also the practical experience of what it means to take this outside of the classroom and see it in your everyday professional life. And when the opportunity arose uh, to join this dynamic group of professors at the law school, it was something that I just could not say no to. Um, me, myself, I'm a first generation student, undergraduate, law school, and um, I think when I look back on my journey, I'm so grateful for the mentors and professors I had in law school that reassured me I can pursue this career in social justice and public interest. I can pursue my passion. The money may come and go. <laughs> but as long as I feel like I'm servicing the community, then that's what's most important. And that's exactly what I've done. So if I can be that person for someone else, then I would feel fulfilled. And with this law school in particular, the commitment it has to inclusivity and diversity uh, appealed to me. The affordability aspect of it, I think, is major. Um, and it's not only affordable, but it's going to be a quality, legal, educational experience for all of our students. I mean, these are, this is a table of game changers. And I really realized that yesterday, speaking with each and every one of them, I'm so honored to be amongst them. So thank you. In order to be a good teacher, you have to be aware of your audience. So I applaud Nicole for noticing that President Harmon actually was here. Uh, and when President Harmon came in, she's giving me the signal that I can't mention her. So I appreciate that, uh, that you did, Nicole. Um, last but certainly not least, 
is uh, Professor uh, Elisa Klein sitting next to me. Uh, Elisa is in a kind of special situation because she's not going to start uh, with us until uh, August of, of 2024, and she finishes her commitment to the Department of Justice. Um, Elisa has uh, an outstanding resume. I used to teach constitutional law. She works in the Department of Justice and has for uh, 28 years, 29 years. And as I was reading her resume, I said, holy Christmas, this person's worked on like every con law case I teach. Um, she was uh, a clerk for Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which is kind of the gold standard in uh, legal education resumes. Uh, when we first uh, met, I said to her, uh, okay, you can be like at any law school in the country. Uh, what, what brings you to me? Uh, why Wilmington University? And I guess I'll stop there and let uh, Elisa uh, give you her answer that she gave me then. Thanks, Elisa. Thank you, Dean. I'll pick up on that question. So the first question for me was, how could I leave my dream job? I have been 27 years um, doing appeals in the civil division at the Department of Justice. Incredibly interesting work with the most supportive colleagues, very little ego in management. And at the same time, I've been able to teach law school at Georgetown Law for about 20 years. Um, and what, to answer the question is, I wasn't on a mission to join a full-time law faculty. It's when I heard for the first time about the opening of Wilmington University School of Law, and I heard what its ambitions were in terms of um, making law accessible to so many more people, make it affordable, increase diversity in the profession, and have it be student-centered in all the ways that you've been hearing the diverse ways, such that every question that gets asked is, what can this do for our students? And how can we tailor the curriculum as we get to know them in order to say to any given student, what are your dreams? What do you like? Let's think more broadly. And, and that's me, I'm in. Like, if, if you will take me, I'm in 100%. And so when one of our first conversations, the dean said, one thing that if you join the faculty will be most valuable is that students, when they graduate, will say, but for this school, I would never have become a lawyer. And that, to me, together with the it takes a village aspect, since I'm sure many of you know, um, we'll be calling upon lots and lots of practitioners in, in Delaware and beyond to take placements for our students, and they will emerge with the skills they need and the professional uh, relationships already in place. Uh, as best I can tell, there's no law school like this, and I am very privileged to be able to join in the fall of 2024. Okay, so now you know, this was like the easiest thing I've ever done. How do you not hire these people, right? This was no great insight on my part. This was simply, wow, uh, I can't believe how much this message is resonating and the quality of people that we had who were interested in, in joining us here. So that's my feedback, yep. Um, questions, anybody, uh, media, uh, people in person, Heather's coming down to take the mic in case anybody wants to say anything. Anybody? Jeff, chat questions? No one? This is just like a law school class. <laughs> <laughs> Should I start calling on people? Yeah. Um, so I know that your curriculum has been different in a couple, a number of ways. So one of which is going to have two required courses the first year, and the second year, and the um, third year, and the fourth year. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, when, when, you, when you build a faculty, it's great to have really cool people, but as, as, as Laurie Meehan tells me, we still have to fill out the schedule, right? So we've got to do a little bit of making sure we get all our courses covered. Uh, the program we're doing here is our first two years will be required. So these people will teach all the students for the first two years in the basic subjects that we think they need to pass the bar and to be lawyers, right? That's 20 subjects. So we now have the faculty, uh, we're already scheduled out for uh, 
23, 24, and 24, 25. Right, these people will teach. All of them are going to be adding uh, one or two more teachers, and then that's, that's enough for what we're doing. So, yeah, we're, we're making sure that everybody takes the courses that they need. Uh, for both the bar and for practice. Again, if you don't know legal education, you'll be surprised at how many basic courses uh, people just don't take anymore. Uh, and we're gonna just take that away. And then your third year uh, will be taught almost entirely by adjuncts and uh, a student is gonna get to craft uh, their third year completely between internships and substantive courses. So if you wanna do a major in intellectual property, you can do that, healthcare law, you know, whatever. We will just get adjuncts who are practicing experts in that field and, and we'll get it done. So, thanks. Others? Anybody else? I'll, yeah. I'll bring the mic. Hi, you guys are fantastic. <laughs> uh, your resumes are wonderful and you know, we are so lucky to have all of you here. Um, my question actually is something that maybe is a little broader in, in just talking about, you know, the courses and things. What, what kind of challenges do you see in the profession of law that you think that you will be needing to address with our students? And um, I have a brother who's a lawyer and, and we talk a lot. So I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of things are out there for the future that you will hopefully be addressing? Uh, I've got a two hour version if they want to hear me, but uh, anybody, uh, yeah, right. Anybody else want to try that one? I think. Yeah. No, you're good. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I think the, the pandemic really changed the way we practice law. Before the pandemic, um, we do a lot of in person type of presentation to the courts and to your clients. Now we do most of that remotely. Most of your filing is done remotely. So we have done a paradigm shift on that. So that's something I think you need to equip these new lawyers for, is to be versatile. You have to be able to deal with the client and you have to be able to do remote filing and remote conferences and remote decision making. So it's the changes in the law. And plus, I think one of the things that the pandemic did to us is that it's changed our social behavior. You know, we have to learn again to how to be nice, how to <laughs> interact, and sort of uh, um, get the point across uh, after being isolated for so long. So th I think that that's gonna be one of the challenges. I'm gonna ask uh, Veronica Finkelstein to talk for just a second. You know the. The paradigm you probably all have of a legal trial. You know, I God, I was going to say Perry Mason and realize there's like three of us who know what that reference means. Uh, but um, you know, the whole idea of standing up and doing an opening and cross-examining witnesses and stuff like that, it's dated, right? Settlement is a big deal. Uh, coming together in mediation is a bigger deal. And I'm going to have Veronica talk for a second about how legal education needs to learn to do both, right? We need to also start focusing on pre-discovery and settlement and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm a practicing lawyer. What I do every day is skills, skills, a series of skills, one after another, written skills, oral skills, negotiation skills, everything I do, and the same is true. All of our very different practices from appellate work to criminal defense, it's all about the skills. And we're envisioning a curriculum here where we are building those schools in with a skills in with a holistic view of what lawyers actually do. We're hoping to have a great trial advocacy program, but we're also hoping to focus in on some of the other skills that don't get attention at other law schools. I currently teach a pre-trial skills class where I take students through every step of litigating a case from the moment someone walks in your door and says, I have a problem, all the way up until being ready to go to trial. Those are the skills that we do every day as lawyers, and those are the skills that are underemphasized at many law schools. We're talking about oral advocacy skills for appellate argument, 
that's the fancy glamorous stuff that we, you know, the, the job we would all love to have. But we're also talking about negotiation skills, how to get together in a room with another attorney and practically hash things out, what to do when you disagree on a discovery plan and you can't agree on what the timeline should be. So we're viewing advocacy at this law school in a very broad, holistic way. And we're committed to making sure that students emerge from this law school with the skills they need to go out into practice in addition to these important doctrinal topics. Yeah, last thing I would say, which I think is critical, um, I've taught con law, for, constitutional law for a long time, uh, up until my last class, uh, last semester. Um, I talk about race, I talk about sexism, I talk about gender discrimination. I talk about all of it. And every one of my fellow con law professors said, I can't believe you talk about that stuff. We avoid it. And my reaction is, if we can't talk about this in law school, if we can't create an environment where you learn at least to respect the side you don't agree with, we're doomed, right? If law school classes have become so far non-confrontational, that we're unwilling to talk, or we're so far invested in one side of the argument that we've demonized the others. That's a problem. And I've told all these people, right, we don't dodge tough issues in our law school. We teach respect, we teach professionalism, and kind of echoing what Judge Small is saying, right, we've got to get to a point, especially as lawyers, where we can respect, hey, you know, I don't agree with that side, but okay, they're not irrational. I, I see their arguments. Don't agree with it. I'm not persuaded by it, but they're not demons. They're not evil. And that's a paradigm that we need to break. And most law schools are not even trying to break it. They're basically trying to avoid the hard discussion because the faculty members are afraid of something. I still don't know what they're afraid of, but they're afraid of something. But we're going to bring that into our classrooms and try to get people to start to understand that for the future of America, we've got to learn how to talk about issues like this and not feel as if you know, we're dealing with some satanic uh, influence on the other side and understand their arguments. And again, may not be persuaded by them, but at least understand them. Uh, yeah. Phil, we have, we have two questions. Um, the first is, can you, we talked about Delaware, but you can talk about what our curriculum will, will do in terms of allowing people uh, to take the bar exam in other jurisdictions. Yeah, I better take that one. Yeah, we're in Delaware. Delaware is our home. Uh, but when you come to our law school, you can go anywhere you want, right? Our job is to get you any place in the country where you want to practice and get you to pass any bar that you want to take. While you're here, we expect you to be involved in Delaware. And we expect you to take advantage of Delaware. Uh, public interest jobs, mentorships, internships, all of that kind of stuff uh, is, is important. Uh, some of, of our students will decide to stay because of that. Some of our students will decide to leave. But yes, we are a national law school. Uh, we expect to get applications from all over the country. And if you want to be in Yuma, Arizona, and you want to practice family law, it's our job to get you there if that's what you choose. So yes, we will prepare you. We will give you, I call it an education in legal uh, testing, right? We will prepare you to pass any bar in the union and, and get you to where you need to go. And another question, can you uh, discuss part-time students in their externship opportunities that they will have. Yeah, we have uh, two people already on board uh, working our career services office to get externship and internships opportunities for people. Uh, that's a particular challenge for the evening program, right? I mean, you're working uh, usually a job and then you're coming out and getting uh, uh, your classes done. Uh, but again, in our third year, we give academic credit for internships and externships. And we think that that's what makes it possible for third year students to have those opportunities. Uh, so, you know, you're not having to have an externship and then also having to juggle, uh, you know, a 12, per 12 credit 
uh, load or something like that in doctrinal courses. So if you're a part-time student and you want externships and internships and you haven't had a chance to do it for your first three years, your fourth year is up to you. You can take it almost entirely as internships and externships. Now, again, in fairness, some of those may be during the day. But uh, uh, Professor Klein will tell you um, the federal government is working more and more on internships that are over Zoom. Uh, that you can do more on your own time. You want to talk about that for a second? So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, it's one of the wonderful things that came out of the pandemic. Obviously, many tragic things, but in terms of it opening everyone's eyes to the possibility of different ways to give people experiences who otherwise wouldn't have access. So, you know, from just the Department of Justice's perspective, we went from only having externs from the, the local schools to having externs from everywhere in the country. And also the ability for them to craft their externships. So perhaps maybe it will be a few hours synchronous and other time asynchronous. So it would be consistent with working hours um, or other family obligations, whatever those might be. And um, we've discussed it at, at the previous press conference, but can you discuss the uh, ABA approval process and how that's going to work? Sure. Uh, ABA approval, pretty straightforward. We have to have students before we can apply. So the first time we can apply is March of 2024. Uh, once we make that application, they will send a site team to visit us in uh, September or October of 2024. And then in March of 2025, they will vote uh, provisional accreditation. And again, uh, the ABA is very strict. I can't guarantee anybody we're going to get provisional accreditation, but I can assure you that we're going to submit uh, a very, very strong application. Uh, it's a nice way of saying we're all old on the staff, but uh, uh, the least experienced person on our staff has 15 years in legal education, and everybody else is more than that. Uh, so we're confident, and we're especially confident because, again, of the strength of Wilmington University, the, the support we get. Uh, you think we have a facilities problem when the ABA comes to the site inspection? I mean, look at this, and then we'll have plans for the new building. Uh, no, we're, I think we'll be, we'll be very strong in that application. Others? Okay. I, I understand that I'm standing between you and the food, uh, so uh, I will wrap it up. But before I do, uh, I want to make sure we understand that, that we can't do this kind of event with just me and, and, and us. So a uh, special shout-out to Bill Swain. And, and Paul Patton, uh, uh, where's Taylor? Uh, Taylor, who does all the work from the law school to get this stuff up. And of course, uh, President Harmon and uh, the entire uh, university community who always come out, who always support us. Uh, uh, Dr. Ellis also, uh, also runs the building. Uh, in case you wondered, I have no idea about tablecloths. It was Dr. Ellis who didn't like the tablecloths, rejected them, and then drove to the place and picked them up so that they would look as nice as they look. So, yeah. Dean Clashes, we have one more question. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I don't mean to delay the snacking anymore. But, no uh, problem. One last question. Uh, do you, did you, have you guys received any applications yet? If so, how many and what enrollment numbers do you expect for the first uh, semester? Yeah, I'm going to, so I defer that to Jeff. Jeff, Jeff uh, Zervati at the back is our admissions right. He looks at the stat, I don't know, every 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but our, our target would, was, was to be 50 students in the day and 15 students in the evening, and, and I made that number up. Uh, I really don't know where it's going to fall, but we're, we're, we're pleased with the numbers uh, that we're getting. We knew all along that they would be later just because of, you know, we're still getting a website up and everything else that, that should be, uh, actually our website should be fully functional in a week or so here. Um, so we're, we're proceeding pretty well on course. Jeff, you wanna, you wanna chime in or? Um, yeah, well we have thousands of prospective students. Uh, we have, of course, fewer applicants, but about 40 applicants at this point. Many admits out um, with people with really interesting backgrounds. Um, doctors, professors, uh, finance, real estate. Uh, we have students admitted to go to the point all the way from to California at this point. Uh, now, hopefully, they will become our actual students, but we are seeing a, a, a very strong interest. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I would end with, uh, we started this endeavor with the idea that we wanted to reach people who hadn't thought previously about going to law school. 
when Jeff coined the phrase of barriers, right? We're trying to knock barriers down. Uh, the good news for us is we're reaching those people. We're getting all kinds of appointments and people coming in who are like, you know, I never thought of going to law school. I didn't think it was possible until I saw your stuff. And the problem is that's when we have to tell them that the ABA mandates that they have to take the LSAT. They have to take a standardized test before they get in. And people are like, I didn't know how to take a standardized test. We calm them down. But you, you, they don't give that test until later in the year. You have to sign up for the test. You have to take it. So that's why we knew all along that our applications would be more back-end loaded. And I think we're starting to see uh, that result is as more people are showing up and saying, okay, I got my LSAT score now. But that's part of the problem. Okay. Thank you again so much for the support. Uh, we're all going to be here. If uh, anybody wants to talk, media, or you guys get to know these people. And again, uh, we welcome them all to the Wilmington University uh, community. Thanks again.